All right. So kind of last time, we were talking about the Exodus, and we were looking at it from the perspective of the children, so those under the age of 20. Um, and we had gone through to the 10th plague. Now we're going to do a fun challenge. We are going to try to get through the next 40 years of their life tonight. <laughs> so uh, basically just roadmap for everyone is we're just going to pick up there and just pick different things that happened along those 40 years to just see how that would have affected and grown these children in Christ to be the people they were when they entered and went through the promised land. Um, so one of the biggest events that happened after the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, was the parting of the Red Sea. Now, how many of you guys learned about this in children's ministry whenever you were little, right? They went up to the Red Sea, Moses hit the staff in it, and the Red Sea went like this, and about 30 people on the screen walked through, right? That is not what happened, so not even close. So what Let's set the scene, and I'll tell you, I'll give you guys the references. I'm not going to actually read it because of how many we have to go through and how long it would take. I would have you all here all night. The parting of the Red Sea, it can be found in Exodus 14. So if you want to turn, kind of follow along, I'm going to just try to paraphrase it as we go through. So what happened is the ch all of the Israelites left. They finally, after the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh said, just go, leave, Right? We oftentimes, you really got to look at the censuses, the census that they took to really understand the magnitude of how many people left Egypt. It was not a few hundred people. The numbers they've estimated are right around a million people. That's how much, that's how many Israelites there were at this time right? Um, when you look at the numbers, no, they only count the men. Double it for the women, double it for the kids. You got about the number that they're really looking at, right? So these people were leaving, and God himself was coming as the pillar of cloud and fire, and it was leading them through. And Egypt, the pharaoh, decided to come chase back after them. They said, what did we just do? And they are coming and marching after Israel, and they're getting close to where the Red Sea is at. And they're being led by God, and they see, they turn around, and they see Egypt coming back for them to take them back. And fear takes over this entire crowd. They murmur, and they say, why did you send us here to die? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? Out of everything God just did, that was their first immediate response. But how often do we respond like that, right? We got to remind ourselves what God's capable of. And so God, the pillar, he f goes to the back. So he's passing through all of the Israelites. The presence of God is. And going to the back. And he sits between the camp of Israel and the camp of Egypt. All night long. So imagine as a kid right, because we're looking at the perspective of the children, and there is this giant threat, but the presence of God is blocking it. And then they say, Moses, reach your staff across the sea. But that, it didn't part right away. The wind blew all night long to part that Red Sea. So as a kid, you're sitting there, and you can see what's the e Egypt right there. You can see the danger but then you see the glory of God in front of it, protecting you, and you hear what he's doing behind you. And, you know, what would you think as a kid? My daddy's got me. <laughs> Maybe, right? That's a good thing. Maybe they'd be taking on the fear of their parents, right? The parents that are scared, that think Egypt's going to do anything. Because sometimes our kids, they don't know better, right? They follow what the adults do. But then... It becomes light, and there is the Red Sea completely parted for them, and they get to walk through on dry ground. 
that here's the one thing that you're going to start really seeing throughout this next 40 years is they see God judge over and over and over and over again. And part of God's judgment is after all of Israel's come by, he says to Moses, put your staff back over the waters and close it in on the Egyptians and kill them all. And every single one of them that went into that sea, they never came back. Now, as a kid, you've just crossed on dry land and you turn around and the waters cave over all of those Egyptians and you see them all die. How would you feel? What would you think? Anybody? Thank God for obedience. <laughs> right? <laughs> thank you, God, for grace. Thank you that I'm in Israel and I'm not an Egyptian. You know? But we see that. And I would just feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude and thankfulness that that wasn't me, that I'm still alive, that God chose me enough to save me. Maybe they're starting to think this, right? Then we're going to jump to two chapters later, Exodus 16, right? This is manna, right? So immediately, maybe not immediately, timing is a little bit different, right? After this, Israel starts to grumble, and this is where judgment comes. It's right after they're grumbling. You'll see this throughout the pattern as they grumble. And they say, why did you bring us into this wilderness to starve? We have nothing to eat. And God said, okay, I will bring you food. And the next morning, but he's also using this food to test them into whether they'll be obedient or not. It says that directly in the scripture. And so he drops this manna. Keep in mind, he's feeding about a million people. All right? This is tons and tons of bread spread out over the ground, blanketing it like snow, enough that they can all fill their jars and eat for a whole day and be satisfied. That's the power of God. And what God told them is for the six days, you go out and you get what you need for that one day. On the sixth day, you better go get two days because I'm not giving it to you on the seventh day. You're going to rest. And what they saw is some people listened and some people did not. They, over, they got more than what they wanted. It spoiled. It went bad. And on the seventh day, they went out to go get food and they didn't have any for the day. Right? Now think of yourself as a kid. This first week this is happening, and you're just so excited because there's food, and it looks like snow, and you're hungry, and you've been hungry this whole time, and there is food there for you to eat, right? I don't know if you've ever seen kids get really excited over pizza, right? Get that in kind of in your head, right? So that you're all excited for this food. Now, let's say you had a parent that was disobedient to God, and on the seventh day, they said, hey, go out and get some food. And you go out there and there's no bread. And you're like, God said there wouldn't be any. And it was so, right? So they're starting to learn that God says what he means and he's going to do what he says, right? And they're starting to see that maybe their parents, maybe they don't have it all figured out. The older ones might be, right? And this is the thing with the manna. For the next 40 years, God fed them every single day of their life. They never went out. So imagine, because we'll get to the part later where they, you know, everybody knows the story. They didn't, have to, they didn't get to go in the promised land. They had to wander for 40 years. There were kids born in that wilderness. So from the moment they could remember, God fed them every single day. They never had to go without food. They never had to go seek it out. All they had to do was go and give what God provided for them. So when we get to the promised land, you're going to see a generation of kids that knew God would provide for them, that never had any doubt that God would do what he said he would do. Then right after this miracle, this amazing miracle with manna, we're going to go to Exodus 17, 1 through 8, and that is water from the rock. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, quail came too. 
Baptist manner. If he told, if God told Moses to send everybody out to get two quarts each, mm -hmm. that's why. Mm -hmm. of manna. And if you convert that to big drums, that's like 10,000 drums mm -hmm. of bread or manna each day. Yeah. Each day. That's a lot. That's a lot. And th there, will, there will be critics that will try to say, oh, it was just due, it was a little small amount. They couldn't have been because there was like a million people and they fed them all. You know, it was a gigantic miracle that happened every single day. Absolutely. I still grumbled, right? Every time I start grumbling, I think about this, and I go, sorry, God, <laughs> don't do it to me, because we're no different, right? We grumble, we sin. After God tells us not to, we still keep habitually sinning. But, you know, this is a good reminder of what happens if you don't turn back. So then we go to Exodus 17, 1 through 8, and it's water from the rock. So they've been given this bread. Every day they're being fed. And now they grumble, and they say, you'll see again the pattern of grumbling. Are we going to, why did you bring us into the wilderness? Are we going to die of thirst? And God tells Moses, go strike this rock and have water flow out enough to feed water all the people, all their livestock, and be plenty of water for everybody. And it was so. He went and struck the rock, and water flowed out. And I encourage you, because this rock incident happened multiple times, just a study on your own time, so, is to compare the rock to Jesus and both scenarios and see what you find, or how it should have been, not how it happened, how it should have been. But they've actually found this rock. They actually found it where sudden erosion came out. Um, and they've been able to prove this event through actually seeing it. Um, now imagine as a kid, you're standing in, it's the desert, right? There's no water anywhere. That's why we're all, everyone's grumbling. It's thirsty. And then this giant river <laughs> shows up, right? How happy would you be? You know, how many of you guys have seen kids that like to go jump in the puddles? right? Yes, right? So uh, do you think these kids wouldn't have been excited, maybe started to go play in this water and just drink until they're happy and they're fulfilled? But what are they seeing? God's going to fulfill their need. They're not going to have to be thirsty. All they have to do is ask, not grumble, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't grumble. Now we're going to come to one of the biggest, I say biggest, there's a ton of big things throughout this story, and it's Mount Sinai. And this you can find it in Exodus 19, and then it will pick back up in Exodus 32. All of the time between that is God explaining the laws, the tabernacle instructions, all of that. So basically, Israel has come to this mountain, and God calls Moses to come up. But before that, he says everybody needs to consecrate themselves and be prepared because God is going to come down and speak. And when God shows up, this mountain is shaking and trembling and it is on fire. Think of like a volcano, something to that effect, right? So these kids are seeing God and they are seeing this presence and this shaking and everything else. And to the point that everyone's terrified. They said, please, like, you go talk to him. We will go hide over here, right? We don't want any, nah. You, you go talk to him. They are terrified of God. So Moses goes up, and he's up there 40 days and 40 nights while God's telling him the laws. And I, I listen to an audio Bible. And every time I hear this next part, I immediately go, mm, because what they did is they're like, we have no idea what happened to this Moses. Go make us God so we can worship them. And, they, and Aaron says, go give me all of the gold rings that you have and we'll make a God. And they make a golden calf and they decide to start worshiping to it and have a big feast. And they say these words, 
these are the gods that took you out of Egypt. And I hear that and I go, hmm, because I know what's about to happen. And God tells Moses on the mountain, go down because the people have sinned. And he's down there. And even Joshua comes up and he's like, there's fighting in the camp. It sounds like a war going on. It's not a war. They're dancing. And he comes in and he sees everybody worshiping this calf. God is angry. Very angry. Moses is very angry. And he has these tablets of stone that God wrote, and he breaks them in his hand. He is so angry. And he comes down, and he talks to the people, and he says, who is with the living God? And this is where the tribe of Levi stands up, and he says, strap on your swords and go kill your brother, your neighbor. And they started slaughtering these people that went and worshiped this calf. Now imagine as a kid, let's say your father was one of the ones worshiping this kid and a Levi comes by and kills your father in front of your very eyes. What if you were one of the ones dancing because your father was dancing? You didn't know any better. And you were spared just because you were a kid and you saw your father die for it. How would you feel? Would you not be terrified? You'd be terrified. I would be if I saw, I would be heartbroken that I just lost my parent because of that, right? But this was so significant because God had originally called the firstborns to serve as the priest. This moment is what changed to where they were, the, tri- the Levites became the priest. And you, know, you can actually read it further. The tribes had to pay the tribe of Levi um, for the amounts. They had to count up all the firstborns. They had to count up all the tribe of Levi. And the difference, the tribes actually had to pay Levi for it because God said the Levites will be the priests now because of this right here. But when you be terrified as a child, start listening to what God's saying because these adults just got killed. They got slaughtered, you know, in front of their very eyes because they started worshiping another god. And the next part, it's Numbers 13 and 14. This is where they got banned from going into the promised land, and they had to wait for 40 years. And so what happened? They sent out the spies. The spies came back. Caleb said, we need to go up immediately. We can take this land. He had the right spirit, right? But the other 10 gave such a bad report. And this is where groupthink comes in very, very badly. So if you can do anything else, trace everything back to what God says and not what man says. It's one of the biggest lessons. And to trust God, bigger lesson. And all these people... They come in and they say, why did you send us here? Why did you send us to die to these people in this land when we were fine in Egypt? Let's get a leader to send us back. We'll go back and be slaves, and we're going to stone these people here. Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua, we're going to stone them to death because of what they did. And they literally had the stones in their hand, and they were about to stone them, and God came down. You don't think that was a little bit of a terrifying sight when God came down and he said, let me smite them all down and I will start with you again with you. And then he declares his judgment because Moses intercedes and says, don't do that for your good name, not for what these people did, but because you are good. And because if you do this, everybody's going to think that you just brought them here to kill them and that you were not saving them. Do it for your good name. And, Moses, and God concedes, you know, wonderful relationship to see. If you really want to know how Jesus intercedes with God, read the story of Moses because he's doing that. It's a very good parallel. And then God says, okay, anyone under the age of 20 or 20 and over will not see this land because the people started grumbling that their kids were going to die out here and they weren't safe. And God came in and said, no, your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness and these kids will be the one that get to go see it. But as for you, you will die here. You will not get to see it. And they, the next day, they they repented. They were going to go run out and take the land and they got whooped because God meant what he said. Y'all will walk through this wilderness for 40 years. 
Now imagine being a kid and your parent, unless you were the son of Caleb or Joshua, because those were the only two exempted, your parent just got condemned to death by God. How would you feel? Be heartbroken for him a little bit. But you'd want to make sure it never happened to you too, right? Seeing your parents, because there's a lot of kids that do this. They have to see their parents that aren't following God. And this is God's way of saying, you have a choice. You can be like them and be condemned to death, or you can come with me and you can have your promised land. It is your choice. That's what these kids are being taught by God right now. But let's take a scenario here. What if your best friend had just turned 20 and you were a couple days away from turning 20 and you were 19 when this happened? Your best friend just got condemned to death because they started believing what these people said and not what God said, but you were spared. How would you feel? Be heartbroken for your friend, but grateful at the same time that it wasn't you. These are the real things that these people felt. And so now they're told to wander the wilderness for 40 years. So we're going to jump to a story in Leviticus, really short. It's Leviticus 24, 10 to 16. And it is where the son blasphemes the name of God. And when they're talking about this, there's actually in the Jewish culture, there is a specific name they have for God. And they will not say it. They are this terrified of saying the name because of this stuff right here. And this, this passage actually also shows you that some Egyptians came out too. It wasn't just Israel that left. There were Egyptians that said, bye, I will go serve this God, you know. And so this was a family, whereas Israelite woman, Egyptian man, and they had a child. And I don't know if this was a child or an older adult that just says son in the Bible, right? But he blasphemes the name of God. And they lock him up to know what to do to him because he's just broken one of the Ten Commandments. And God says everyone that hears it will stone him to death just for saying the name and blaspheming. He got stoned to death, and the people had to do it. How would you feel as a kid seeing that? There's a reason they don't say the name anymore. They were terrified that they feared and they started having reverence for God, that he meant what he said. And God was teaching them to respect him. I see a thought on your head. Are you processing? Okay, okay. I see the wheels turning. I'm like, okay. So this scenario happens, right? We're going to jump back to number 16. And this is Korah's rebellion. You will start, you'll probably hear, you hear about this probably a lot throughout the Psalms. You have to go back to Exodus when they go through the genealogy of Levi and show Moses. Korah is actually related to them in, within the tribe of Levi, right? So Levi has been called to be the priest. They eat, each of the tribes have been given different roles. Aaron is the line for the priest. They're the ones that can go. Only Aaron's line can go into the Holy Holies. Nobody else can. They're very clear on that. Well, Korah and then... I'm going to go to this so I don't butcher it. They basically did not like that Moses and them were in charge. They didn't like the position they had been given. They wanted more power. Let's see this. Help if I go to number 16 and not numbers 6. So they basically rebelled against Moses. And there were more than just Korah. It wasn't just them. There were 250 men that came too. And they were saying that you take too much on yourselves. The entire community is holy. Every one of them. And why are you lifting yourselves above everybody else? And basically... I'm trying to figure Make sure I have this wording right. I'm 
I'll skip over it. But they were basically, I want to say right after this when I was listening to it, they were talking about, like God had just made it very clear when he, and I don't know how long the timing is between these two, but he picked Moses when the 40, you know, whenever they condemned him for 40 years. They were coming back and saying, well, everyone's holy. It's not just Moses, it's all of us. God's already shown them that he expects Moses and Aaron to be leading here. So they were contesting that, basically. And so, basically, the solution they have is everybody come bring your incense, right, before God. And we're going to see who God picks as to be, to be the leader. And as they're coming through this, God clearly chooses Moses to the point that he says everybody else better flee and get away from them. And Moses says, this is how we're going to know who God picks. If they die a normal death, then God picked them. But if they go alive down to Sheol, then God chose Moses. And immediately, and they're sitting there in their camps, they have their tents, their families, so Korah and all of them, their wives, their kids are all there. And you're a kid, you're standing on the outside, you're trying to figure out who God's going to pick, right? And then you see them fall, and the earth opens up, and all of them fall alive into this open pit that just magically appeared, right? Didn't magically appear, God did it. Imagine if some of those kids were your friends, and because their father decided to be disobedient to God, they all died. Not only that, they went alive down into the pit. You know, they didn't just die and then fall. They were probably, have you ever seen in the movies where the, you know, the earth opens up and you see the person and they're like, ah, as they fall down to their deaths? That's what this was. But it was men, women, children, all of their possessions, everything falling down into this pit that God had made. And as a kid, let's say maybe you're an older, older man, right? Do you not start trying to lead your family the way God's telling them to be? Or maybe, may, see, maybe you see that. Maybe you're mourning because your best friend just fell down there and you're a kid. Then you, you tell yourself, I will do what God tells me to do. So I, my, me and my family, we don't end up like that. Then imagine seeing the earth swallow someone whole because they didn't obey God. Now we're going to come. The next one's going to be Numbers 21, 4 through 9. It's a bronze serpent. And basically what happened, the people got impatient. They started murmuring again. And so God sends these fiery serpents through them and starts killing people off one by one. And they come to Moses and they said, we sinned. Please go talk, pray for God, pray for us, right? Help us because we've sinned. And they put this bronze serpent on a pole and tell you, if you will look at it, you will be healed. You've gotten bit by a fiery snake and somebody tells you to go look up at a pole and you will be healed. You know, they're, they are from Egypt, right? They're used to medi like people putting medicine on them and stuff like that, all the crazy things the Egyptians did that didn't work, right? And you want me to just look up at a pole? You know? They don't really go into this in the Old Testament, but they would have had to have faith to do that, to even be able to look at it. What are you as a kid learning? Hey, we can have faith and trust God because he's going to save us. But one of the things, too, when you really start looking at numbers, and they have all these different scenarios, and if you'll read further, it'll tell you they killed off like tens of thousands of people every single time this happened, right? Like when Korah happened, fire went out and killed the other 250 immediately. And there's a reason for that, because God pronounced 
that he was going to kill everybody off in 40 years and you'd be able to go into the wilderness. Well, if you do the math, I've actually kind of semi done this, is you take how many people there were. I did it just in the U.S. kind of in today's time. Took the population, took how many people die a day, got the death rate, right, of how many people you'd expect to have die. Then I did it with based on the numbers that you would see in this time compared to how many people roughly would have had to have been killed off. This was double to quadruple the kill rate. This, you know, we sometimes will experience death for a little bit and then it will go off and we don't really see or hear about people dying. This is double to quadruple the death rate. People are dropping dead around you like flies. For 40 years, you are seeing these people that got judged by God die. But God ha did all these plagues partly to make sure they met the 40 years, right? And then if you look at that bronze serpent, one of the biggest things that it was teaching, you, you never hear an explanation in the whole Old Testament as to why that happened until you get to John chapter 3. And it explains that this was a representation of Christ in the same way that he died on the cross for us. All we have to do is look at it and believe. And we're saved. This was a representation of Jesus coming is what that bronze serpent was all about. But, you know, one thing, too, I just thought about with these kids, you know, they're seeing all these people die. They're seeing these fiery serpents and everything. But you know what God also said when he said, everybody over the age of 20 will die, but it will be your children that enter the promised land? He just pronounced protection over those children for the next 40 years. They're not going to die. They might have to see all of this, they might have to see the judgment on their parents, see them be judged by God, but they're going to be able to live through it. It was a twofold promise by God. It just depends on which generation you're in. And this is one of my favorite stories. It's so Numbers 25, 1 through 9, and it is about Phineas, right? He is the grandson of Aaron, the son of Eliezer. So background for Numbers 25, there's, all, there's this weird little interlude in, November, in Numbers 22, and that's where there's Baal, Balaam and Balak, and, you know, they're asking them to curse, you know, Israel, and they won't do it and everything like that. Well, what's happened is they kind of had a little side conversation in the background that said, well, if Israel sins against God, God will judge them. So... Go put your Moabite women, your prettiest Moabite women near there and just see what happens. And so the Moabite women came and the Israelite men went off with the women they weren't supposed to go to. And God sent a plague through and he started killing people off because he had given them a command. We're not intermixing with these people. We're staying pure to God. And there is this one guy, and they don't, I think they named him. He was bold enough, he brought this woman into the camp and into his tent where everybody could see. And Phineas, in the most American slang you can possibly imagine, went, absolutely not. And he went and he grabbed a spear and he killed them both in front of everybody. And God stopped the plague and said he was zealous for me. And he stopped the plague because of what he did. It's always my favorite story. So, but... What are you, because th this is kind of one of the moments too. Phineas was one of those kids. He was one of those kids in the, through the Exodus. And now you're kind of starting to see towards the end of this, we ain't playing games. God's given us commandments. We've seen what happens when we don't obey God. And Phineas came in and said, absolutely not. We are going to obey God here. And if we're not going to, you're dying. And he went and he killed them all. And for our society, we look at that and we go, that's horrible. You know, but they didn't have cops back then. The men were the cops. If you saw somebody disobeying God, it was your responsibility to punish. And Phineas came in and said, nah, -uh. we are going to be pure and we're going to stay with what God's called us to do. Seeing one of the kids. And all these kids started being like that. 
They knew that God meant what he said, and he said what he meant, and they were going to follow, and they were going to do what he said. And if you weren't doing it, they were prepared to kill you and get you out if they had to, so they would stay pure to God. But they've been seeing for the last 40 years that God will provide every single one of their needs, that he loves them, that he cares for them, but he is their God, and he wants no other gods beside him. So now we come to where they're getting to go into the promised land, right? They had to even see that Moses didn't get to come because Moses was disobedient. You know, God told him to speak to the rock and he struck it. And that sounded like such a harsh punishment for the longest time. I'm like, Moses did all this? He dealt with these people for 40 years? These grumbling, horrible people that you yourself, God, wanted to kill off all these times? And he does one one thing? He just smacks the rock instead of speaks to it and he doesn't go? What? He showed me. Moses was representing me in front of the people, and he represented me wrong. And for that, he didn't get to go into the promised land. How often do we misrepresent God? Because we're all leaders in some way, some form or fashion. But God held him to such a high standard. And not only that, Aaron was killed right then and there for that. You know, they switched it over to Eliezer. Moses, he only got to see the land. He didn't get to walk into it. And he said, not only that, but you will train Joshua so that he is ready to go in. And when Moses died, they mourned for him. And then God sends Joshua in. And you have an entire generation of kids that all they have ever really, really known is that God will deliver them from evil that tries to come after them, that God will take care of their needs, all of their physical needs, food, water. You know, even their shoes. They walked around for 40 years. Their shoes never wore out. God even took care of their shoes. He took care of every single thing they needed, but he did have commandments and laws, and he expected them to put him first. He was the God. He wasn't a list, one God on a list of many. He was the only God. And this generation grew up for over 40 years, and God taught them that. So then we're going to go to the fall of Jericho, and this is where we're probably going to end. It's Joshua chapter 6, right? Now, God gives the weirdest commandment in this war, He says, I need all of you guys to go walk around the town and be quiet. I need you to do that for one day, one time for six days. And then on the seventh day, I need you to do it seven times. How weird is that? For them, it wasn't weird at all. They had manna, tons and tons of manna drop down from the sky every single day to feed them. Water would appear out of a rock. All of the plagues they saw in Egypt the parting of the Red Sea, all they had to do was sit back and just listen and be obedient to God. This was normal for them. They didn't even question it. And we can kind of see why after seeing their 40-year journey. Because I would, now how many of you guys would have trouble like being quiet (laughs) while you're walking around, right? We would be, not them, they knew, but it'd be quiet. They knew better. We're not going to go into the story afterwards where somebody didn't know better, but they knew that God would do it. And one of the things we kind of miss in our translations in the English is they say at the end of the seven, then you give a great shout. Our translation kind of misses what that great shout means. It is a shout of victory. They were to shout and praise God for the victory before the war even happened. And you know the fun thing too? Not the fun thing, but the fact thing. The people in Jericho were terrified. They knew what God had done 40 years ago in Egypt. Egypt was probably still recovering from that, right? They had to get a new pharaoh. All their stuff was wiped out. They had no animals. They had no food. They had nothing for, you know, they didn't recover from that 40 years. So anybody could go through Egypt, and they could probably still smell the stench. 
And Jericho was terrified to the point when the two spies went in, Rahab said, we already know you <laughs> You guys have the living God. We know we're not going to be able to make this. And they came back and they said, the whole land's terrified of us. You know, we got, you know, God's got this. But that's all they had to do was walk around the town and give a great shout of victory. And God gave them the city. That they had to go through over 40 years to be able to learn to trust him enough to do it. So I'm going to end there. Lord God, thank you for this time, Lord. Let this message be received well. Help us to not be like the adults in Israel. Help us to not keep turning back to our slavery and to our sin, Lord. But let us be like the children. Let us see you and your truth and be raised up to become those mighty warriors that went to Jericho and they learned how to praise you before the battle even started. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.